Hello and welcome to Henley on Thames, which for my overseas viewers, yes, that is the same Thames that runs through London, but here we are several miles further to the west. Now Henley has very much a reputation associated with boating, most notably for the Henley Regatta, but today it's the turn of a festival of traditional boats. There's Henley itself in the distance, and the festival is held on the riverbank and in a field just outside the town. Historic and classic boats of all shapes and sizes moor up to be shown and discussed and take part in parades, with the pontoons organised into different categories shown on the site map. This is just one very typical example of the kind of boat you'll see here. And, as you'd expect, they're all buntinged to the max though, being nautical, those flags may actually mean something. The first section is the one I marvelled at the most. These are all little ships of the Dunkirk evacuation in 1940. It's utterly mind-blowing to think that these tiny wooden boats went across the English Channel under fire from the Germans and rescued hundreds of thousands of stranded Allied troops, getting shot up and badly damaged in the process, many of the boats and their brave captains making the trip back and forth several times. Just look at them, they're barely more than river boats designed for pottering about, having a nice time. Yet they made that unbelievable trip and survived, with restoration I grant you. They look so very elegant. This little ship is Aquabelle. It not only brought back soldiers from Dunkirk, but towed five other boats as well. She was originally built in, in April 1939 by my great, great, great granddad, Benjamin Taylor. She was built by William Osborne and she was launched in Little Hampton. In May 1940, she got uh, requisitioned by the War Office to go over to Dunkirk and assist in the Dunkirk crossings. She was damaged, there were cleats torn up, one of the hatches was missing, and there was a soldier's tin mug and sock found in the rear cabin back here. She's been used for a lot since. She was chartering in the Mediterranean for a bit, in France, and she was eventually found abandoned in France and being used by squatters until someone from Marine et Tradition took the boat, they started to restore it, and they formed L'Ami de Aquabelle headed by a lovely man called Alan. But it's back here in England with my granddad and we've been looking after her ever since. Here's another little ship that went over three times in six days and was renamed to honour the hometown of the Dutch soldiers that were rescued. And this tiny but oh so pretty boat saved 34 soldiers. Moored nearby was Tom Tit which in 1940 was stolen from Ramsgate by two brothers who wanted to help with the Dunkirk evacuations. They just took the boat and headed off to France, saving many, many men. All the stories are incredible. Hilfrenor here was sunk twice during the evacuations, once in France and again on the Goodwin Sands off the Kent coast. Refloated, the boat remained in service throughout the war. There were many, many more, I couldn't capture them all, but they're all beautiful and extraordinary boats with a history unlike any others. Also beautiful boats, to my eyes at least, are narrow boats, and though these weren't part of the festival, I spotted many canal craft heading up and down the river throughout the day. Hangborn and also in Henley. So Gillian is... Uh quite close to the tea rooms here by the bridge. They were clearly enjoying all the spectacle from the water as they went by. Raysbury Boat House, Tim O'Keefe. A couple of narrow boats were taking part in the festival. The entry rules restricting metal boats like these to only those which had genuine riveted hulls, as this tug clearly has. The key word is traditional, hence the strict rules of entry. 
although quite where the amphibious fleet fits in that description, I'm unsure, fascinating though they undoubtedly are. How did this narrowboat get in then? No sign of rivets here. Well, I'll tell you, it's a wooden hull, originally built in 1946. Of course, this being the Thames, any boat could come by, and they duly did. Day boats, hire boats, leisure boats, rowing teams, the lot. It was, in many ways, anarchy on the water. Here's Windsor Bell, a trip boat which ran a regular schedule throughout the weekend. Moving on from the Dunkirk ships, many other categories awaited, like these cabin launches. And there was a pontoon or two for slipper launches, so named for the shape of their stern beautiful little river boats designed to carry between four and eight passengers. I really rather took to these. They're like the Jaguar E-type of the waterways. Of course, I spoke to one of the owners. It's a Brook 1935 uh, with a 1962 Morris Vedette marine engine and we believe it's one of the mermaid class which there was very few of them actually made. Recently we've had the engine out and totally uh, detailed it with all the engine parts being powder coated, polished up and then refitted back. It's just had another two coats of varnish, uh, new leather upholstery fitted into the cockpit. So a fair bit over the last year. Just purrs along like a nice boat should do. There's something splendidly absurd about steam power in such a small boat, but at the same time it's rather wonderful too. That's the engine. That's the boiler. I consider myself an expert now, of course, following the video I made recently about a steam narrowboat. This is very much an event of boaters wearing straw boaters and ladies lounging under parasols. Are you uh, parading in a short time? Look, it's the epitome of classic Britishness. But did the lady have tea and cake as she went along? This boat shows how it's done in style. The festival had a whole section for human-powered craft. And human-powered doesn't always mean rowing, as this catamaran pedalo shows. <laughs> Other sights worth seeing included this Dutton amphibious car. And I think that's a Land Rover, isn't it? There were silent electric boats. There were open launches. There was a section for small cruisers like Sorrento Star here. and a load of Bates Starcraft. Plus some very pretty boats from the Thames Vintage Boat Club.
Finally, working boats also got their chance to shine. Here's where the classic narrowboats were moored. I'd somewhat presumptuously invited myself aboard Aquabelle for the Dunkirk Little Ship Parade after lunch. All the parades had detailed commentary from the ladies in this tent. A board of trade, 1930s lifeboat, she's only 20 feet. I headed back to Pontoon A, where the little ships were a hive of activity as they prepared to sail up and down the river for everyone to see. Engines were started. Lines were cast off. And despite the sun, some had taken the formal dress code very seriously. With all the boats largely tied to each other, this became quite the untangling exercise complicated by a never-ending stream of other boats coming past. They don't hang about these boats. I've not speeded this up. L'Orage, which we briefly saw earlier, was once owned by the legendary TV broadcaster and RAF Spitfire pilot Raymond Baxter, who co-founded the Association of Dunkirk Little Ships. The reason all these small boats were called up by the Admiralty in 1940 was because their shallow draft meant they could get much closer into the beaches of Dunkirk than bigger boats, and were therefore better able to rescue the troops. An order was made requesting all owners of self-propelled pleasure craft between 30 feet and 100 feet in length to send all particulars to the Admiralty within 14 days. Around 850 private craft sailed from Ramsgate. Over 250 were lost, but 338,000 men were rescued. Aboard Aquabelle, we backed off the pontoon and headed upriver. The river's divided up into sections here. I think it's put in place for the Henley Regatta, but left set up for this event too. The idea is to separate festival boats from general river traffic, which still has every right to pass up and down here. It means there's one-way traffic closest to the festival, so we'd have to go up, turn, and then go back down, getting in line before coming back for the official parade. That's Henley Bridge, built in 1786. And here we lined up to turn around to go downstream. Imagine living here with the Thames at the bottom of your garden. And fancy having what looks like a garage but is actually a boathouse. You are looking at multi-million pounds for those houses. Right, into the central section of the river, and as just mentioned, that means sharing with all the other traffic, from canoes to day hire boats. No surprise on such a warm weekend that the river was very busy indeed. There's a good look at the festival, as seen from the water. Uh. 
Further along and on the opposite bank were several moored boats. How splendid it must be to moor here and enjoy the spectacle. Up ahead, Temple Island, which is hired out as a wedding and corporate events venue. We'd turn around this before heading up in the parade. All these are Dunkirk little ships, lining up in their positions on the programme so the commentary can be given in the right order. To that end, we needed to make up a couple of places, so we sped past some other boats. Isn't that a magnificent view? Come on, hurry, hurry, you'll be late for the parade. Ah, there's the narrowboats again, sitting pretty on their pontoon. and for the onshore onlookers a treat as the little ships came by. Many waves were exchanged, many photographs were taken. For reasons unknown, we had the safety boat alongside. Parading over, the fleet returned to the moorings. Well caught, sir. Back at the van, which I'd parked under a tree for shade, I had a nap until the evening's illuminated parade, although both the camera and I were struggling to focus on the flashing lights, so this is all a bit blurry, but you get the gist. Yes, that really is the pedal catamaran. Thanks for watching. Cheerio.